sound out our answer? Because the normal force is perpendicular to the displacement at any point on there. No, instantaneous displacement, I should say. That means the angle between them is 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 degrees is equal to zero. But why couldn't like we choose sine or whatever? Because dot product is defined by the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Oh, okay. okay. If you want to use sine, just wait till we get to rotational motion, then we get to use sine. Okay. That's cross product. So wait, so sorry. So so that's the equation for the dot product? Yes. Okay. Three work energy relationships. We have the work energy theorem that the total work is equal to the change in kinetic, the non conservative work is equal to change in energy, and the conservative work is equal to the negative change in potential energy. And I think this middle one here, I could do it from a couple other, I could do it from any of them, but I'm going to take the middle one here. And so I have work non conservative is equal to change in energy. Zero is equal to E final minus E initial. Because we've established for this problem that the non-conservative work is zero and change is always final minus initial. And E initial to the other side, I have E initial is equal to E final. In other words, energy is conserved, which is what happens when there is no non-conservative work. Well, what kind of energies do I have? Assuming no spontaneous combustion. <laughs> what are the two that I care about in this problem? Kinetic and potential. Yep. So I have kinetic initial plus potential initial is equal to kinetic final plus potential final. So they should be equal because it's conservative? Because the only thing doing work is a conservative force, therefore energy is conserved. Okay. about to ask the question to just sort of mentally prepare yourself for the course of angels. Here we go. I see some people looking up quickly, so just. I'm still writing. Apparently, you didn't spend the weekend memorizing this. No, I didn't. Sorry. <laughs> What's the formula for kinetic energy? One by mv squared. Not quite the course I was hoping for. Don't worry, you'll have another chance. Yeah. yeah. What's the formula for potential energy? There is a max. I heard two voices. What? It depends. On. Thank you. That's the answer I was hoping for. All right, the, what is the potential energy formula associated with this conservative force? Weight. Is it just mg? Weight is the conservative force. What's the potential energy formula associated with that? Is it one half mv squared? It is not. That is kinetic energy. It's um, uh, mgh plus constant. Okay. So M G H initial plus constant. Uh, let's use the letter. I don't think we're using C for anything. And just the final stuff. So that's equal to one half M G final squared plus M G H final plus some constant. Now right off the bat, the constant's going to go away, which is generally why it's not written. Now the question is, what can we get rid of? Mg. Let's make Mg go away. Well, technically we could make all of it except for the velocity and mm. its yeah. height go away. So the initial velocity, initial height is zero, and the left side just goes away. Uh, so make the initial, oh, I can actually stick what's going on over here. 
So his initial speed is approximately zero meters per second. He is sitting out here at the very peak. He is just in unstable equilibrium, and a gnat lands on his back, which is just enough to get him to start moving. <laughs> so this is zero because the initial speed is approximately zero. And Jacob, you had another suggestion? Um, the height would be zero if you just set the origin to zero right there. But if the, wait, if kinetic energy is zero, is it still kinetic energy? I would, I would make the claim, yes, from a philosophical point of view, that zero joules of kinetic energy is still kinetic energy. Still kinetic energy. Okay. We just have the origin. Yep. We we're blaming Jacob on this one. Mm -hmm. So my problem has now been reduced to I have absolutely no energy to begin with. And so at the end, how much energy do I have at the very end? Uh, the same amount. Yes, zero. And that's equal to one half mv final squared plus mgh final. Is that assuming you're stopped at the end? No. Okay. Well, what we're trying to figure out is what is the speed at the end? Okay. You're saying we didn't like get energy from an outside source. We just had the same as what we started. Yes. Okay. There's not because work is required to transfer energy. Non-conservative work is what's required to transfer energy from one object to a different object, and there is no non-conservative work being done. Gotcha. Or the non-conservative work is zero. Yeah. I had a question. So yes. That would be the case if he was using his um, ski uh, poles. Poles. Yes. If he's using ski poles, then we have another non-conservative force involved that is helping move them. Okay. So that would be non-conservative, but that wouldn't be transferring from one object to another. The object, the, he'd be transferring energy basically between himself and the ground. Okay. Yeah, let's get to that. Yeah. I, I suddenly thought, oh, wait a second, is there something else involved? But I mean, ultimately it is the ground okay. pushing on. In an ideal situation, if I'm on this, let's just say, level flat, flat ground, and I put my ski poles in and I push, I'm actually shifting their back a little bit as they push them forward. Okay. All right, so we've reduced it down to this. We can reduce it one step more if we want to. I'm sorry, I'm backtracking a little bit. How do we get... Um Potential, initial potential energy, the like MVH initial, how do we get that to zero? I kind of was nervous. <laughs> Jacob said make the initial potential energy zero. Okay. Because Jacob said so. Good yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can I do like 100? Pardon? Can I do like 50 or 100? Yeah. Yeah, so you, yeah, you make the. Because what ultimately is important is the change of potential energy, not the exact value itself. And so. By establishing zero up there, we've now set what the height is down here. Also, Next. what is WNC zero? The e, uh, EF minus the uh, non-conservative oh, work. That's the non-conservative work. I have only two forces involved. I have the force of gravity, which is conservative, and normal force, which is non-conservative. The non-conservative, by the fact that this non-conservative force is perpendicular, 90 degree angle from the displacement means that it doesn't do any work. That's, that was this whole bit. Dot product is basically the magnitude times the cosine of the angle between them. And if the angle is 90 degrees, it so all of those all. are zero, the, the all of that W total, WMCF. There is a change in kinetic energy, there is total work being done. But the C and the NC are zero? Uh, conservative work is being done also. There is a change in potential energy. Non-conservative work is the only thing that we've established as zero. Until Jacob came along and decided to make the initial potential energy zero. 
Is that what BJSS stands for? I guess Jacob said so. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, so so we changed the one half mv squared to zero. Like like so so that zero is for all of all of that. This is just the initial the initial speed I for the problem I just said is close to zero. Okay. It's basically starting at rest. Okay. So but but if if that was if, if that was like a, another number, then we would multiply the speed by m and one half. I would square the speed and then times the m times one half. Okay. So can we eliminate mass over here? Yes. Every we can divide everything by mass, and it cancels out. So I, my problem has now been reduced to one half v f squared is equal to negative g h final. So my final speed is equal to two negative 2 g h final square root. Some students like keeping mass in there and they plug the numbers in early. No problem with that. But there's a reason I did not give you the mass. Now a negative under the radical here means that a another negative better show up, otherwise it, there is no solution. And I feel pretty sure if someone starts at the top of a hill, skis down to the bottom, it is a possible problem. So another negative better be showing up. So negative two times, where does that negative show up? In the height, in the final. The final height is negative. Yes, final height is negative. Negative 50. It's going about 65 miles per hour at the bottom of the bottom of the So, all right, I, I hate to touch on this again, but if We know our displacement and our force, and our, um, I'm sorry, that it is force and displacement. Yep. Um, we know they don't matter because cosine zero is ob obviously zero, and that's just because it's perpendicular. But um, when we, if we were to need that, would you give us a displacement? Yeah, if I threw friction into it, in which case friction definitely is anti parallel to the displacement, I would have to tell you how long the slope is. Okay, and then we'd use that, the, we'd use the dot product of that times the cosine of the angle from the beginning or where he's at? From the, it depends on how I gave you the information. If I just said that the length of the slope is such and such and the average friction force is, and I gave you a number for that, then you would take the average friction force times the overall distance traveled. Okay. Methods. Okay. If uh, officially what you'd be doing is an integral, you'd be using calculus and you would friction would vary. It could, it could get complicated or easy depending upon the slope. Okay. Or medium hard to really difficult depending on the slope. <laughs> okay. If this were just a straight ramp, that would be something that you could handle. For sure. All right. So I guess to the bottom, he enjoys it. He gets back up to the top again to do it all over again. What he does not realize is that there's a cave in. Oh, no. 
Cave. Cave in. Cave in. Oh. Big old hole here. He doesn't realize it until he's on his way. So he comes in and goes. Oh. <laughs> well, get these clouds and cotton balls down to the bottom. He's not hurt. I was about to say he survives miraculously. That's right. How fast is he going when he gets down? How fast is he going when he gets to here? Zero. Well, I mean, after he comes to rest. Just before we, if we take that into account, similar to what we did with projectile motion, once it hits the ground, once it touches the ground, we are now introducing another force. Acceleration is no longer constant, so Kate formulas don't apply. Here, once he hits the ground, we have a non-conservative force acting on him, and suddenly the problem changes. Okay. So even though the wording would be, how fast is he going when he gets to the bottom, the Understood and question is how fast is it going just before he hits whatever is at the bottom? Okay. Would it be the same final speed as the previous dispersed drone? It would be. Are you about to answer that, Brooke, or are you about to ask the question? No, I was about to ask you a question. Okay. Is this line that you drew of him falling into the cave, is that the path he follows or is that just more snow? That's the path he follows. Okay, yeah. Because wouldn't gravity, like the force of gravity acting on him would still be the same regardless of. Correct. Yeah. That makes sense. I wouldn't have gotten out of hand and didn't say it though. I probably wouldn't have like, come up with something crazy. Is, is it the same because there was no friction in the first? Right, that would definitely okay. change it. So what we have here is nothing here changes. Once he falls, once he goes into the air, ignoring air resistance of course, once he gets into the air, normal force doesn't exist so it can't do any work. Before he goes into the air, normal force wasn't doing any work in our nice ideal case. So non-conservative work is still zero. That doesn't change, that doesn't change. Kinetic and plus potential is still my energy here. It's still started at rest. Jacob's rule still stands. <laughs> Nothing here changes. Matter of fact, if he got here and he fell off the other direction, you'd be going about 31.304 meters per second when he gets down here. The velocities are not the same, but the speeds are. What is that? Yeah, um, so that equation that we have down there um, with the zeros below them, so how did we get from, from that to um, the half mvf squared on on that side here yeah because my initial kinetic energy was zero and we established that the initial potential energy was zero the left hand side of this equation is zero oh okay so and we so already canceled the constant out so like so so both sides of that equation is 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 what we dealt with yes i mean this is initial energy equals final energy so this is my initial energy, that's my final energy, they're equal. Okay. And then we simplify and solve. So v, oh, I'm sorry, the V is standing for speed. Yes. In my head, I thought for a second it was velocity, and I was like, I don't yes. know. Direction is not involved. Which is a real advantage to dealing with energy conservation is the fact that we're not dealing with direction. But because we're not dealing with direction here, we do lose some information in our answer. Right, questions before I start erasing? Yeah, um, what is that? So next to the plus sign um, on the right side, what is that? Uh, what is that plus sign there? Yeah, yeah, like so what's next to it? That's MGH final. Okay. That, that's much better. Now, he survives the, the cave-in, lands down, 
the kittens shown a path to get back to the top of the mountain from the steps inside the mountain. Because, of course. While he's climbing his way back up, it snows and fills in again. He's going to do this one more time. In the interim, just to make this incredibly realistic, the owner of the ski resort there installs a giant spring at the end. You know, the way ski slope under it. <laughs> With a K value of 40 newtons per meter. Now this K, this spring constant, this is the spring constant. is an indication of how much force it requires to stretch the spring. It takes 40 newtons to stretch it one meter. It takes 80 newtons to stretch it two meters. How, long, how much force is required to stretch it three meters or compress it? Uh, 120. Yeah, 120. Newtons. Newtons, yes, sorry. And it's easy enough to find on the slinky. It actually, again, still works pretty well. You can attach a mass to the end. That mass has weight. It'll stretch it down to a new equilibrium spot. You attach more mass, it stretches it more. More mass, it stretches it more. And plot it. You can figure out what the spring constant is. That's so, for a future lab. So if we're compressing it, it's more force. If we're contracting it, it's less and force. For the ideal spring, compressing it a meter is... A, takes the same amount of force as stretching it a meter. Okay. Same magnitude of force. Okay. So what I want to know is how much does the spring compress? Because it's going to come down, hit the spring, the spring's going to compress, and then scoot them backwards. So delta x final equals what? Then we still have the same velocity from last time? Yeah, but we're going to start it from up here. Okay. We could start it from down there, given that we already solved that one, but we don't have to. Yeah. But we do need a mass now. So let's give them a mass of 70 kilograms. Which is roughly average mass of a human, adult. The 